We are very honored to have with Bogman, a professor at Austin Seminary, here for four sessions. And it came about because people in this congregation and friends to this congregation were very interested, obviously, in the, how do you say, Abrahamic? Abrahamic. Abrahamic. <laughs> 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 so, uh, we had a lot of interest in that, obviously, and I know for a fact, looking around, that I think every Christian denomination is represented here. There are people here from every major denomination in one time in their life. Mm -hmm. Many of them became Presbyterians or were always Presbyterian. So uh, I thank you for coming and I thank the Board of Austin Seminary for encouraging professors to travel the state teaching in churches. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's something I enjoy doing. Um, so we're, our pattern is that this week we're going to go and do Judaism in 45 minutes, um, which is foolish. <laughs> and next, uh, next week we'll do Jesus as a Jew, Jesus the Rabbi. Um, after that we'll look at Islam and the fourth will also be Islam and some uh, probably modern Islam. And so, so let me start off with uh, Judaism. Um, Judaism is one of the smallest of what we call major religions. In fact, it's an interesting question when I do teach the world religions course, why do we study Judaism at all? If there are only about 15 million uh, Jews in the world, why don't we study the Sikh tradition, a uh, much larger uh, tradition, much larger footprint in the world, uh, or some of the Chinese traditions? Uh, but we don't study those, it's limited time. We study Judaism. And the reason is that, particularly for Christians, Judaism has a great deal of importance. So we do study uh, Judaism. Um, so who is a Jew? This is a really difficult question. Uh, because in part, Judaism is an ethnicity. It is a tribe. And the descendants of that original tribe of Israelites who were different tribally from the Perizzites and the Edomites and the Moabites and the Canaanites and all those others that you read about in the Old Testament. Uh, so in part, they are the descendants of the Israelite tribe. Uh, but that's not really helpful now. That was a millennial, three millennia ago, or two and a half. So things change, people intermarry. So who is a Jew now? Uh, one definition, a classical definition, is that a, a Jew is someone whose mother was a Jew. You always knew who the mother is. You're not necessarily sure who the father is, but you always know who the mother is. So if you're the son or a daughter of a Jewish mother, then you're a Jew. That's a classical uh, definition. But uh, what do you do about conversion? Well, conversion used to be common back in the time of Jesus, uh, but um, nowadays it's discouraged. And actually from about the fifth century on, conversion was, is discouraged. And that came both from the Jewish side and the Christian side. Uh, so nowadays, if you want to convert to Judaism, you go to a rabbi and say that. The, the classic uh, approach is that the rabbi will say no. Uh, go a second time, no. And a third time, well, maybe, but only if you go through this long course of study. And then there is a process for conversion. Uh, but a Jew, because it is, in a sense, tribal, it's governed by descendants, not by, or ancestry, not by belief, um, you can have secular Jews. You can have somebody who's Jewish by identification but does not practice Judaism. So you have a lot in Israel. Perhaps 30, 40 percent of the people in Israel would define themselves as secular Jews. 
they're Jews by ancestry, they're Jews by identification, but they're not Jews by religious practice. Uh, and then you have hyphenated Jews. You have Jews who are also Buddhist, Jews who are also Hindu. You do not have Jews who are also Christian or Jews who are also Muslim. Uh, it happens with the Eastern traditions. Um, you do have, though, you do have the Messianic Jews. Uh, these are Jews who recognize, they present themselves as Jews who accept Jesus as the Messiah. So their ritual practice is a practice according to the Jewish liturgical model, but, uh, but they believe in Jesus as the Messiah and as the Son of God. Uh, Jews do not accept these as legitimate Jews. And there's a great deal of tension there and a great deal of sadness on the part of Jews when they see a Messianic Jew handling the Torah scroll uh, and so on. Um, and so that's a really difficult issue and it raises a larger issue in the study of religion, uh, who's in and who's out. Um, are Mormons Christian? We argue about that. Uh, some will argue about whether Seventh-day Adventists or, uh, or Jehovah's Witnesses are Christian. So there are fuzzy boundaries in all religions. Uh, so it, we talk about Judaism, but, when we, but we also talk about the Israelites. Were the Israelites Jews? Yes and no. Uh, the Israelite religion was a religion centered around the temple. And the ritual practice was a practice focused on the temple. Uh, and that remained um, uh, to the exile. And at the exile, when the uh, 586 uh, BC, when the temple was destroyed, then the leadership, not all Jews, the leadership was taken over to Babylon. Uh, they developed, in a sense, a different form of Judaism. They had to because they didn't have a temple. They didn't have priests who could operate as priests. So they developed a textual form of Judaism, a textual form of faith. And when they came back, and you see this in Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, they had a text, and the text was read. And this is really the beginning of Torah Judaism, uh, or as we might refer to it now, rabbinic Judaism, the root. So in the second temple period, from the exile into the exile, they came back to Jerusalem, they built the second temple. You had two things operating in tandem. You had temple Judaism, and you had textual Judaism. But then, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed again uh, under Titus, and then temple Judaism disappeared. No temple, no temple Judaism. And what was left was what we now know as Judaism, which is rabbinic Judaism, which is textually oriented. There still is liturgy, and in a way some of the temple liturgy has continued in a transformed way in modern Jewish liturgy, but uh, it is transformed. Uh, so out of the destruction of the temple came two things. One was... Um, uh, a Jude form of Judaism that believed in the Messiah, that became Christianity, and of course the Gentile tradition, which is our roots, uh, Gentile tradition established by Paul. Um, both of those came out of a common source and were precipitated, in a sense, by the destruction of the temple. Uh, <coughs> In modern Judaism, you have movements. They're called denominations there, but they don't refer to themselves as denominations. They refer to themselves as movements. The, um, I put different percentages in the handout. It depends on who you talk to. So the handout, I think, was orthodox at 13%. Uh, the Reform Commission is the largest in the United States, somewhere around 35% of Jews, and it came out of the 18th century, a reform movement in Judaism. 
conservative movement actually is a little bit more recent. It is um, between Reform and Orthodox Judaism. Reform take the law um, metaphorically. The facts follow some of it, but not all. Uh, conservatives follow more of the law, and the Orthodox take the whole of the law as uh, applicable and try to follow the entire law. Of the Orthodox tradition, you will find uh, the majority of them in the United States will be called, were parody. Uh, outsiders call them ultra-Orthodox. That's not what they call themselves. They call uh, themselves heredy, uh, which means tremble. They tremble before God. And they follow the law even more explicitly than the Orthodox. So they are within the Orthodox. Within the heredy, there is a subset of uh, the Hasidim. Uh, the Hasidim came out of Eastern Europe. And they are, you might call them, the lovers of God. Uh, so, okay, onward. Okay, I refer to rabbinic Judaism as a Judaism of the book. Uh, what book? Uh, the book is the Torah. Now, the Torah, it, that word is a very um, big word. It's kind of like gospel. Gospel can refer to a specific text, the Gospel of Luke. But if you say that's Gospel truth, you're using Gospel in a different way. You're using, in fact, you can use Gospel in a sense to represent the whole message of Christianity. So it's a very flexible word. And Torah is like that. Torah specifically represents uh, a scroll. It's the first five books of the Bible, the first five books of Moses. And it's usually in a, um, in a uh, synagogue, place of worship, uh, like this. Now, this is not a real one. If it was a real one, I would not be carrying it around like this because it would cost 20 grand or 30 grand or so. And this one costs a lot less. It's a fake. <laughs> so, but, um, but I want to point out something that represents what I was just talking about, the transition from temple to Torah. Uh, and that's this. It's a breastplate. Now, if you remember, if you read in Leviticus, uh, the priests wore a breastplate, uh, an ephod. And so the Torah scroll is dressed up in priestly garments. So it has a breastplate. Then it has this thing, which is called a yod, which means hand. And it's a finger. It's a pointer. Because a Torah scroll is hand-lettered in a very particular way. It may take a year to produce a Torah scroll. It's sewn in a particular way. Uh, and it is uh, uh, all done by hand in a very particular way so that every Torah scroll is identical, although there are two st historic streams of Judaism, the Sephardic, which are the Spanish Jews, and the Ashkenazi, which are the European Jews. You also have Middle Eastern Jews, Mitzrahi Jews, and they all have, they have different styles of printing. But essentially, it is uh, the Hebrew Bible, which is the Torah, which is the first five books, written somewhat like this. And so every um, Friday or every Saturday on Shabbat, they will read a portion of the Torah scroll. They go through the whole Torah in a year, except that actually it's three years because the yearly segments are so long that they only read a third of them. And in the fall, there is a special holiday called Simcha Torah, in which they celebrate the Torah scroll. They uh, dance around with it. They also drink, because it's important that you be joyful. And, uh, that's true. That's true. Uh, and, uh, and then they roll the Torah scroll back to Genesis from uh, 
from the end back to the beginning. So, um, so the Torah is the first five books, and it's what's in the scroll, which is stored in an ark, and the ark represents the Holy of Holies in the temple. Uh, and they bring it out ceremonially, and they put it on a particular desk, and they read it, and people are invited up to read it, and then it is put ceremonially back. And you, you do not touch it uh, with your hands. There are rules of handling and so on. It's a holy object. Um, but beyond that, there is what we call the Old Testament and what Jews call the Tanakh. The Tanakh is an, is an acronym. It stands for Torah, uh, Nevi'im, which, which is the prophets, and Ketubim, the writings, which is everything else. Um, so what the Jews would call the Bible, the Old Testament, uh, is what we call uh, what we call the Old Testament, they call the Tanakh. Um, and it's entirely different except for the words. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, the reason this is fake is because a Torah scroll will not have the vowels. Uh, and this one does. Essentially, this is a humash. Well, I didn't put this word which is this one that you would study, which has all the vowels, and it's cut up and glued together to, <coughs> to look like a scroll. Um, so, why are the Torah and the Old Testament, uh, the Tanakh and the Old Testament different, all except for the words? The words are exactly the same. Uh, but, uh, first of all, we read them differently. Um, and we organize <coughs> differently. So I've handed out, um, so you have a tana. Uh, I want you to stand up, turn around, and read the last two verses, and tell us what book they're from. Okay, this is Second Chronicles uh, 36, 22, and 23. It says, And in, in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, when the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah was fulfilled, the Lord roused the spirit of the King Cyrus of Persia to issue a proclamation throughout his realm by word of mouth and in writing as follows. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any one of you, of all his people, the Lord God, be with him and let him go up. Okay. Interesting that the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, ends with King Cyrus, who's not a Jew, not an Israelite, he's a Persian. But it ends with that one word, aliyah, meaning go up. So when you had, in ancient times, the Tanakh, what you had were a pile of scrolls. And a pile of scrolls do not have any particular order. You kind of have a pile. Uh, but when you start binding them into a book, you have to order them. You have to decide which order all these books go in. So the Tanakh, the Jews, <coughs> ordered their books to end with the Book of Chronicles. And we call it Second Chronicles. And the reason we have a First and Second Chronicles is because Chronicles is so so long, you couldn't put it in one scroll. So you put it in two scrolls. Um, otherwise, there's no reason to have first and second chronicles. It's just chronicles. Uh, so, but the, there's a theology behind the organization. It's not haphazard. So the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, begins with creation, as does us, and it follows along the story until it gets to the exile. And the way the text ends is with return to Israel. So the theological theme of the Tanakh is creation, exile, and return. Uh, now let's read the Christian Bible, the very last part of the Old Testament. What book is it from? Uh, this is uh, Malachi, uh, book 4, verse 4 and 5. Remember the law of my servant Moses, 
the statues and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and smile, the, smite the land with a curse. Okay, ends with a curse. That's not very good. Uh, okay. But you see, the Christians organize their text um, with a whole thrust to the prophets, and then it leaps right into the New Testament. So the very fast, last words of the Old Testament are words about Elijah predicting the coming of the Messiah, and then you go directly into Messiah, into Matthew, and the Messiah comes. So it's a theological organization that happens throughout Scripture. Have you ever wondered why the division between the first and second creation stories is not the division between chapter 1 and chapter 2, but Adam and Eve's story begins in chapter 2, verse 4b? Uh, well, it's theological. Christians wanted to take the Sabbath and separated from the first one and put it on the first day of the week. So it's the theology, in a sense, a uh, dispute about the Sabbath that led the medieval Christians who put in the, the verse and chapter divisions, they're not original, uh, put them in making a theological statement. Um, so Christians read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. So when we, we read the Isaiah, uh, which is one of the preeminent, important chapters for Christians, um, when we read Isaiah, we read it as talking about the coming of the Messiah. We read the servant songs uh, as referring to Jesus. Needless to say, Jews don't. Um, Jews privilege certain parts, and they read the uh, Jewish Bible through the lens of the Talmud. Uh, so, uh, here's a Torah scroll on uh, the Yad uh, with the breastplate. Um, here is where the Torah scroll is kept in the Ark, um, which has doors on it. Um, so, uh, Talmud. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai, he received two things. One is that he received the Torah. He received the Ten Commandments, but really he received the whole Torah. The five books of Moses, they're often called the Pentateuch, it's often called the Five Teachings in German, and the, um, or the first five books of the Bible. Um, that's the written Torah. But he also received, according to Jewish tradition, the oral Torah. He received an oral teaching. So not everything that he received is written down. And indeed, Jews believe, amazingly enough, that what Moses was given on Mount Sinai was the whole of the oral tradition of Judaism. Uh, so when there are stories, there are funny stories. Jews have great stories. Uh, there are stories such as when Moses comes and, and is sitting on, on a class of Rabbi Akiva, that's second century, and, um, uh, and Rabbi Akiva is saying this particular argument, and thus it was received on Mount Sinai by Moses. And Moses says, I didn't know I said that. Uh, and, uh, Rabbi Akiva says, yes, he is. <laughs> so, so the oral Torah, um, what is it? Where is its roots? Its first roots are in a book called the Mishnah. And this is a falling apart copy of the uh, translation of the Mishnah. The Mishnah was produced around, uh, written down around 200 AD. And uh, it is a record of debates among the rabbis about Jewish practice. Now I want to insert a very important um, concept here. Judaism is about practice. You practice as a Jew. 
You don't, you're not a believing Jew, you're a practicing Jew. We talk about believing Christians, we don't really talk about practicing Christians. So Christianity is founded upon core beliefs. Judaism is founded upon core practice. Islam is in between. Uh, so it's not that Jews don't have beliefs, it's not that Christians don't have practice, but the way that you become a Christian is by confessing belief. The way that you become a Jew is by starting to practice. Uh, you become a bar mitzvah, under the law. Bar means uh, son, uh, mitzvah means a commandment. So you are son of the commandments. And the commandments are commandments of practice. So you have the, the um, okay, that's wrong. That should be not Midrash, but Mishnah. Um, have to correct that. So you have this original text of the Mishnah. And it contains things like this. Um, this is a question of the Sabbath. Um, and it says here that the main labors prohibited on the Sabbath are 40 minus 1, uh, sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, cleansing, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing, wool washing and beating, and on and on, tearing, uh, uh, sewing two stitches, tearing in order to sew two stitches, hunting a deer and slaughtering it or fanging it, uh, uh, extinguishing, kindling, striking with a hammer, uh, carrying from one domain to another, etc. They're 40 minus 1, 39. Um, so these become the subject of a great deal of discussion. Well, what does it mean to sew two stitches? What does it mean, carrying from one domain to another? Carrying what? If I carry a pencil, how about if I carry a stick of firewood? How about five sticks of firewood? How about eight sticks of firewood? Uh, but you can carry the firewood, but you can't kindle a fire. Uh, so what does kindling a fire mean? How about if I turn on a light switch? Is that kindling a fire? Yes, because it makes a spark. And therefore, that's a fire. Therefore, I can't turn on a, a light switch on the Sabbath. Well, how about driving a car? No, because you put the key in the ignition. You're igniting something, therefore you can't drive a car. Well, okay, so, so you get this long conversation, endless debate, and it gets very picky. So, or I won't read it now, was what if a house is on fire, or the synagogue is on fire, what can, what can you take out? Uh, so, long discussion, what's the point? It looks so, it's what we tend to refer to as legalism, and that's a negative term. But, so here's the question I raised. Uh, all of this is about protecting the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for a time of rest. What means, what is rest? Uh, Jews do not define what rest is, they define what work is and exclude it. So rest is what you can do after all these other things are excluded. And it's called building a fence around the Sabbath. Uh, so the question I ask the students is, is a Sabbath incumbent upon Christians? And they say, well, yeah, it's in the Ten Commandments, Fourth Commandment, unless you're Catholic, and then it's the Third. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, they, so then I ask, how many of you keep a Sabbath? Well, none of them do. Some of them raise, well, I, you know, I spend two hours in which I turn off my phone. Two hours. <laughs> uh, so, we don't have a Sabbath, though we all know that our grandparents did. Uh, we can go back a few generations, and we know that Sabbath keeping was pretty important. But it's kind of gone, and we don't have Sabbath anymore. So we don't have that time of rest. We've lost it. Why? because we didn't build a fence around it. Uh, so Jews are very careful to maintain a real Sabbath, a real 24-hour uh, period of rest. And they do that through this legal debate because we're really good at finding loopholes. Uh, so this is not only a way of closing off the loopholes, but it's also a way of adapting to particular situations. So they think of every possible um, 
scenario that could go wrong, which is why they make good lawyers. We just, my wife and I drew up an estate plan, and it goes on for pages pages and pages of the will. Because they're trying to look at every possible occasion, every way in which somebody might contest something um, and try to close all those loopholes. Uh, that's what lawyers do. That's why Jews make such good lawyers, because they're trained from birth, really, to do this kind of thing. Um, so, but, um, then there's a bit in here which I won't read about the what's called the Shabbat Goy. Uh, Shabbat uh, Sabbath Goy is a non-Jew. Um, what if you can't turn off light? What if you say, hey you, you're a Gentile, can you turn the light on for me? <laughs> they say, no, you can't do. That's a loophole, it's cut off. So my wife was in a, uh, a bathroom as we were traveling along the highway, and there was an Orthodox Jewish woman there. And she had a problem because uh, one of the things you're supposed to do is to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. Uh, but now all the faucets, or many of the faucets, are electronic. You put your hands and it turns something on. Well, she couldn't do that because that's igniting electricity. So she could either um, disobey the mitzvah, the commandment, to wash her hands, or she could disobey the mitzvah of turning the, uh, <coughs> lighting a switch, uh, kindling a fire. And those were the two choices. So she tried to get my wife to stick her hand in <laughs> to trigger the, but then that's a Shabbat Goy. Then you're getting a Goy to do something for you. <laughs> you know. So, you know, she has to choose between those three <laughs> options, each one of which is problematic. So she chose to try to have my wife play the role of Shabbat Goy, which is forbidden according to the law, but she has to break one of the laws, and that's why they have discussions. So I'm sure some rabbis are having a detailed discussion of what you do in that situation. So, um, so you start with the Torah scroll, the five books of Moses, it expands to the Tanakh, which is what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Then you get the Mishnah, uh, this compendium of debates, and their majority and minority debates. It's a lot like the Supreme Court, uh, where minority opinions are retained. So you have debates about disagreements about by the rabbis as to uh, many of these things, and the disagreements are recorded. It's not a winner-take-all at all. So you have the Mishnah, um, and then you get on to the Talmud. And the Talmud takes the Mishnah and has another layer of commentary on it. Um, and there are two versions, one that was made in Jerusalem, which is shorter and the more authoritative one is the one made in Babylonia, because a lot of Jews stayed, stayed back in Babylonia. And it was com uh, completed around 5 or 600 uh, AD. Uh, all of that's oral Torah. But it's not only that, because here you have uh, the Mishnah, the little part in the red box, and the commentary on it, which is called Gemara, and that's the essence of the Talmud. But then, on the outside on the right, this is a page of Talmud, you have the commentary of Rashi, who was an 11th century Spanish rabbi. And it's a very authoritative uh, commentary. On the left side, you have the Tosafot, who, which is commentary by Rashi's two grandsons. Uh, and then around it, you have all kind of marginalia, all kinds of other commentary, cross-references, definitions. So what you have here on this page, and this is what, this is in a sense, the foundational document of Judaism, modern Judaism, uh, Talmud, uh, is a whole history of debate. Uh, and this, it is important to recognize that the debate follows century after century after century through time. And I, I went to a yeshiva in Israel, Jewish house of the school uh, with a friend and who had studied there and he said uh, provocatively, Jews don't read the Bible, they study Talmud. 
So they don't, you don't read Talmud, you study it. Uh, the Bible is for liturgical reading, uh, the Torah scroll, but it's the Talmud. It is this process of argument, of thinking in a particular way that Talmud trains you in uh, that is of the essence of Judaism. So you might say Judaism is an argument. It's an argument with God. Uh, and the Talmud is the training document, the training manual for that uh, document. So I put up this phrase because this to me resonates. Uh, in Judaism, by studying Talmud, by studying the, the logic, and this is the logic that lays in scripture, um, you are appropriating, you are training your mind to be like the mind of God. So you think the way God does. So you would do what God would want you to do, not because you have a particular law, but because you think as God does. Uh, and we have that same concept in the mind of Christ. You know, we don't have a whole lot of practices that are defined out. Really what we, the Christian message is to be like Christ, which really means to have the mind of Christ. So I put that forward as an argument. Um, so you have um, all of this gradually accumulating text, layer upon layer upon layer, until you have Rabbi Blumoff's uh, sermon last Friday evening on Shabbat. And that is just the most recent layer of the Oral Torah. Rabbi Blumoff's <coughs> sermon was also revealed on Mount Sinai to Moses. So that affirms this whole Talmudic process. Um, there is another bit of text called Midrash, and Midrash is creative thinking um, on the Bible. Um, Midrash is all about questions, not answers. So in Midrash, the question would be, well, when Abraham and Isaac uh, trundled off towards Mount Moriah, what was Sarah thinking? What did Sarah say to them? Um, what was Isaac thinking as he went there? What did the servants think? Uh, did Isaac cry out when Abraham put him on the altar or not? Uh, and they ask all these questions which are unanswerable, but the fact that you ask the question makes the story come alive in all of its nuances. And there are lots of different answers, there are lots of different possibilities, but it gets you inside of the text. And the idea of Midrash is, uh, this has a New Testament reference, uh, every jot and tittle uh, uh, counts. So given that God wrote the Torah, every mark, every vowel, every uh, word has meaning. If the same thing is repeated in two different places, it has two different meanings, because God doesn't waste words. God doesn't repeat. Uh, everything counts. So then we, from all of this, we get mitzvot. Uh, mitzvot is a commandment. There are 613 mitzvot in the Bible, and the Jew is expected to follow them. So, um, so the basic question for, uh, for Jews is, what is the path to righteousness? How shall I practice in order to be a righteous person? And the answer is by following the mitzvot, by following the commandments of God. So it's a practice. The basic question for Christians is, how shall I be saved? Saved from what? Saved from original sin. And lots of different ways of defining that. Uh, and the answer is through the risen Christ. So the fundamental questions that Judaism and Christianity hold as the heart of the tradition are very different questions. 
which makes it different to compare them. Um, and uh, uh, okay. So uh, let me stop here. Any questions? Good. So we can rush on. Okay. So um, I'm going to run through this. Uh, the liturgical part. Liturgy is, a, again, a practice. So you look at the liturgy, the worship life of Jews, and it is a practice. It is something you do. It is not something you believe. Though if you practice, if you read the Psalms, if you uh, say the prayers, gradually it certainly shapes the way you think things. But they would not call it beliefs. They would call it, this is our practice, this is what shapes, this is uh, what we hold to be holy uh, and incumbent upon us. So there's a weekly cycle, a yearly cycle, and a life cycle. The weekly cycle is a cycle of uh, prayers. Um, they're usually five prayers, but they're combined to make it easier. So you have a morning prayer and an evening prayer. Uh, and then you have Shabbat. And Shabbat is tremendously important. Some will say Shabbat is the heart of Judaism. Um, so, and there are practices that go with these. So you will find Jews wearing uh, phylacteries, uh, a box which contains uh, scripture passages, that one that they bind on their forehead, one that they bind on their left arm, the side of the heart. Um, you will find mezuzahs, so these are phylacteries, um, and they do it because scripture says to do it. And then the rabbis took hold of this and, and developed an idea of what it actually means. Uh, you have mezuzahs, and you put them on the doorpost. Again, it has a bit of scripture, and it says to put these on your doorpost, where you're going in and you're coming out. Uh, so a Jewish home will have a mezuzah. Also to wear fringes. So you see the rabbis there, they have these strings hanging out. Uh, the instruction is to wear fringes. When Jews wear a prayer shawl, the shawl makes no difference whatsoever, except that you have to cover your head. Uh, so it covers your head. The important thing of a shawl is that it has fringes. So it's the fringes that are important. Uh, and some Jews wear fringes all the time in a garment called a zitzit. Um, others just wear the prayer shawl when they're praying. Uh, and that has the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the fringes. Uh, Jews also, there's an instruction, don't plow the corners of your field. Why? The corners are the fringes of the field. And it is, you leave those corners for the poor. Uh, for the gleaners. Uh, so all of these rules have moral dimensions. And the rabbis are very careful to explain, you're not just following this rule. There is an ethic that goes, there's a reason behind everything. And part of the Talmudic process is to uncover the reason. So the Sabbath, we've talked about a lot of rules and how you do it. The rules aren't that hard when you do it all the time when it becomes the norm. Um, it goes from sundown on Friday to dusk. Um, you light the Sabbath candles. Problem, lighting a fire. You have to do it 18 minutes before sundown. So um, in order that you're not lighting a fire on the Sabbath. And also, you have to blow them out. So you have to do the Sabbath prayer before sundown, so you can both kindle the flame and put the flame out before the Sabbath starts, because you can't do it on the Sabbath. Um, so the various parts, the challah bread, the wine, and celebrating the meal, in some ways the family table becomes the altar of sacrifice of the temple. So a lot of the meanings of the temple altar of sacrifice are transformed, transferred to the family table. Others are transferred to the synagogue, like the Ark, the Holy of Holies with the Torah scroll. 
in the Taurus role as the new priest. Um, so, um, so the Sabbath, you can do no work. Um, the New Yorker is one of my holy texts. So, uh, um, then you have the yearly cycle, which has, as part of its structure, the three pilgrim festivals. Pilgrim, because you made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The Psalms, the Psalms of Ascent, are Psalms of entry into the gates of Jerusalem for these three pilgrimage festivals, uh, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Um, each one has an agricultural application, and then added to that a historical one. So Passover is the time of exodus from Egypt, the uh, Shavuot, 50 days later, our Pentecost, uh, is the, represents the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And finally, the uh, Sukkot, the uh, Feast of Ingathering, uh, commemorates the wandering of the wilderness. Uh, whoops. So, this is, um, okay, um, I'm not going to play all of that. That's the, uh, um, the other part of the yearly cycle, uh, important part, is the High Holy Days. Starts with Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. And then you have the 10 days of awe, and then Yom Kippur. On those 10 days, that's a, a grace period. Because on Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, the books of the record of your deeds is closed. So what you've done, you've done, um, and cannot be undone. Uh, but you get 10 days of grace. So they actually aren't closed on Rosh Hashanah. They're closed on Yom Kippur. So you have 10 days to seek forgiveness from everybody you have wronged. Um, there's the symbol of Tashlik, which is throwing your bread upon the water, which is a symbol of getting rid of your sins, uh, throwing onto moving, living water. A uh, number of <coughs> symbolism. And Yom Kippur is the final day before the books are closed. Uh, to atone for your sins. So it's called the Day of Atonement. It's the Day of Fasting. And uh, the part that I'm not going to play is the Kol Nidra, the, the, uh, which is the key lament that is on uh, Yom Kippur. They do a prayer of confession that's like no prayer of confession that you have ever heard in your life. It goes on for pages. And it confesses sins that you never even imagined that you could ever think of doing. Uh, so, um, uh, on uh, Shavuot, uh, it is the celebration of the law, and Sukkot, they build, it's in the fall, they build flimsy um, shelters to try to experience what it was to live in the wilderness. And the idea is that you should go out and eat meals and actually sleep in this flimsy shelter that's partly open to the sky, even if it's raining, because you are experiencing, sharing the idea that life is contingent. Um, then the life cycle, the bris, the, bris, the uh, circumcision for males. Now for females, they have naming uh, ceremonies so they too can participate in this uh, ritual. Uh, Jesus was taken to the temple on the eighth day. That was his bris. Uh, and uh, the bar mitzvah, or bat mitzvah, that is about 13, 14, when you take on the responsibilities of following the law. You become a son or a daughter of the law, of the mitzvot. Uh, marriage under a hoopah. Marriage is not a religious ceremony, it's a contract. <coughs> Um, but, so they, you draw up a contract with your wife, and often in Jewish uh, homes, you will actually find that uh, ketubah uh, framed in a prominent place. And then death, uh, buried the same, same day, uh, wrapped in a shroud, no coffin traditionally, and there is a whole seven day mourning process of sitting Shiva, uh, Shiva, a lot of rules around that, uh, lesser period of mourning for 30 days, and then a, uh, a yearly remembrance called the yard site, uh, a year time. And um, 
it's, it's impressive to me that Jews have more ritual about remembering death than Christians do. But that's not surprising, because for important Christians, there's this idea of resurrection. Uh, so death is a passing phase, not a permanent phase. For Jews, believing in an afterlife is not as strong. In fact, some will say Jews do not have a belief in the afterlife. Uh, and so uh, death is really uh, an important thing to remember in memory. Um, last thing, uh, mention of Zionism. Remember that very end of uh, Second Chronicles uh, that we read, the very last word is Aliyah. <laughs> Go up, uh, go up to Jerusalem. The whole Tanakh is oriented on this idea of creation, exile, and ending and return. So Zionism is really a celebration of a return to uh, the Holy Land, to the home land. Uh, and there are a number of different kinds of Zionism through modern history. Some of it is religious. Uh, going back to the Holy Land and settling it, uh, resettling it. Some of it is messianic because of the belief that the Messiah will return, when the Messiah returns, uh, will return to Jerusalem. Christians, Muslims, and Jews all believe that Jesus will return to Jerusalem. Uh, so on, uh, it's interesting, in Jerusalem, outside the Temple Mount, you have a Muslim burial ground in the Kidron Valley, the Christian burial ground, and the side of Mount Zion, the Jewish burial ground. Everybody wants to be there. Um, you have secular Zionism, people fleeing persecution. You have socialist Zionism, people wanting to create the, the kibbutz, the new society, a socialist society, and nationalist Zionism to create the new nation of Israel. And a lot of these get mixed together, but they're three different uh, emphases. Um, okay, there are a number of further issues that are important to us uh, Christians. Uh, the idea of supersessionism, which most mainline denominations, certainly the Presbyterians, rejected in the 1980s. The idea that Christianity has superseded or replaced Judaism. Uh, we reject that. We regard uh, now Judaism as a legitimate, ongoing tradition, tradition of two covenants. Uh, Anti-Semitism is something that we still struggle with. Uh, I was with the interfaith director of the Anti-Defamation League in New York, uh, who had been at the Presbyterian uh, General Assembly when the uh, divestment decision was. And what he said is interesting. He said it didn't bother him too much about what they decided about divestment. What concerned him was some of the language used, which lifted up, perhaps probably for most people unknowingly, but came out of the long tradition of Christians discrediting Judaism, uh, or particular attitudes towards uh, Judaism, you know, secret societies, money growing, legalistic, you know, all these terms that are part of Christian prejudice against Judaism. What he was most concerned with was that language. The divestment decision, yeah, that was a thing, but that was not the major concern. It was very interesting. Uh, Jewish Christian dialogue continues, it is fraught because the issue of Israel hangs over it. It's very difficult to uh, maintain a dialogue without getting into that mire, and it's so difficult. Uh, I've been doing Jewish-Christian dialogue for, for decades. Uh, my main study is Islam, but uh, for me, it's important to maintain one's activity in more than one dialogue. Otherwise, that dialogue begins to shape your own understanding of Christianity. You say things in one dialogue that you would never say in the other. Uh, and I see that among Christians. So, um, so we have to deal with our understanding of Scripture. How do we deal with these passages from John and Matthew and various others? We'll talk about that next time. Uh, okay, so that's a rush. <coughs>